Hello friends, I'm Ashish Darbari, founder and CEO of Axiomize, and welcome to my presentation, Comprehensive Processor Security Verification, a CIA Problem. So let's look at the motivation. So I don't think any one of us here in the room would need motivation to understand how bad cybercrime economy is. It's nearly $1.5 trillion. The IP Security Assurance Workshop in DBCon US in 2020 gave a lot of details around this. Processor security, the problem is, you know, we've all heard of Meltdown, Spectre, and a range of other vulnerabilities that have since been coming out. Um, hardware security in general has been not as well understood as software security, but processor security in particular, although more understanding is being gained, there is no comprehensive, consistent security verification methodology for processors. Rigorous security verification for processors is an urgent need. And here's an opportunity for formal methods. Formal methods naturally offer a rigorous method of addressing security verification concerns via verifiable mathematical proofs. I've myself been looking at hardware security for a number of years. And more recently, um, groups of people have been looking at process security. The QED and the SQED approach is notable. However, that is locked into a specific vendor technology uh, that is not usable outside that specific tool. So in general, when I started looking at this, there has been no consistent, complete, and widespread know-how and usage of formal for processor security verification. And then the hard part of security verification is that it requires us to think of a theoretically infinite space of negative actions and consequences. And here is where formal methods um, would offer a great opportunity because formal naturally blasts in a lot of stimulus that we don't normally think of. So meanwhile, while we're looking at all of this, we have to understand the context. So while Accelera IPSA working group is, is working hard on security standard, the CWE has been busy recording vulnerabilities and the open source RISC-5 uh, movement is driving a big processor revolution. So we decided to look at the security problem in the context of RISC-5. So what is the methodology? <clears throat> Scope out the assets, identify the attack surface, specify security concerns, and then formally verify. So, so long as these concerns are validated to be not an issue, we are good to go. So the IP SA working group from Accelera outlined in the talk about the concept of having an asset, a threat, an attack, a consequence, an attack surface. These are rather well understood terms in the context of security and in the context of hardware, what the Accelerator Working Group was saying is you could look at IP um, or anything, you know, that is actually being shipped as part of SOC could be analyzed for security. And an asset is anything of value or importance that is used, produced, or protected within the IP. So in the context of processors, we should identify which assets in the processor are we looking to protect, who needs protection, from whom, which adversaries, and what needs to be verified for these assets, as in what do we need to make sure that these assets are protected against? So effectively, if we understand who has ownership of the asset, what CIA objectives are verified for that asset, so CIA here meaning confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which ones are we looking at being impacted, and against what attacks from which adversary. So if we can define all of this, then we can measure, check, evaluate, and say, whether or not our assets are protected against the attacks from these adversaries and whether or not they impact confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So for every vulnerability found, we compute a CVSS V3 base matrix score to quantify the risk. So processor assets and attack surface. So let's define this. This is the most uh, tricky part because theoretically everything in a processor could be considered as an asset, but not really because anything that is not architecturally visible is not required to be an asset because if it's not architecturally visible, it's not software visible. So what we've looked at is program counters, registers, control status registers, data memory, data caches, basically. Those are the kind of assets that we've looked at analyzing. So ALU, shifters, decoders, all the other compute elements are not considered assets. They basically are compute elements that affect the value of an asset. And if they are in the path of a security attack, the net effect will be on the asset, which is where we check. So the entire processor IO is the attack surface. 
um, instructions read from I side, for example, as soon as the instructions start getting decoded and executed, they could potentially be bad instructions or good instructions, but nevertheless, they are sources of attacks. Uh, interrupt pins, debug ports are all valid sources of attacks. So what makes um, security analysis really challenging is the concurrency of pipeline. Function of pipeline depth, the deeper the pipeline is, the harder it is to, to understand uh, whether or not we are secure. The total number of adversaries and the frequency of interchanging ownership of the asset with every clock cycle. So in our approach, what we've looked at is we've considered the whole processor you know, to be the attack surface. And effectively, in every pipe, and most processors these days are pipelines, so in every clock cycle, at every pipeline stage, one instruction would be the owner of that pipeline stage, and every other instruction would be considered to be an adversary. And effectively, if those other instructions can destroy the ability of the good instruction, the rightful instruction, who's the owner of the pipeline, if they could impact that, then they can, they can cause security vulnerability. We actually do not even care whether those other instructions are good instructions or coming from, um, from uh, deliberate attacks that were orchestrated or they were coming from accidental codes, changes that were left in the design. They could be orchestrated locally. They could be orchestrated from a network. It doesn't matter. So long as the expected functionality that keeps the processor secure is not impacted, we are good. And in our analysis, the line between functional and security, security verification is, is quite thin. So the CVSS view, there are three different groups of metrics that we looked at. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with CVSS, but they um, provide a way to quantify the risk assessment and what they do is they say base metric group, temporal metric group, and environmental metric group. So for now, we've only looked at base metric group and they specify which attack vectors would be used, what would be the complexity of the attacks, what privileges would be required, what user interaction would it need, and whether it would impact confidentiality, integrity, or availability, and whether the scope would be changed. So due to the lack of um, time and space here, I can't go into more details of these definitions. You're welcome to look at the website of first.org. But let me give you an idea of what this is in a second. Let's describe what a security analysis flow is. So here is a processor, <coughs> excuse me, RISC V processor being thrown. And we, we take in the RISC V ISA, we then looked at the security concerns and we build a security analyzer. And we made an app like this. What it does is it creates a security verification plan so it looks at the architectural specification of RISC V and it automatically builds a security verification plan. And what it does is it then gets executed in a formal verification tool. And the formal verification tool would then run these checks um, that were specified in the verification plan. And then we use the CVSS classifiers in our app to then annotate the security verification plan and provide the final status annotated with the CVSS base metric score. So give you an example, here is, an, here is a property that would be written for the asset program counter, where we considered the BEQ to be the legitimate owner of the program counter, by which we mean that if the BEQ instruction is valid and decoded, and that's the one that is being executed in the current cycle, BEQ owns the pipe, <clears throat> for updating the program counter. And if RS1 and RS2 register values are equal, then we expect the next state of the program counter to be the branch address. And you look at the attack vector, it's, it's, it's local because we can actually uh, execute this uh, without having to go through a network or physically touch the processor. Uh, the attack complexity is quite low. You just have to run a program to execute a branch instruction. Uh, the privileges required are are low and user interaction is uh, required. And I, I'm saying privileges required is low because effectively you can just run an assembly program, right? Um, so in terms of scope, the scope does get changed um, when this uh, property runs because the value of the program counter gets changed. And what happens is in this case, the, this, this property fails uh, in IBEX because there is this bizarre security issue, which basically happens uh, impacting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So what's happening here is that you're in the controller, FSM is in the decoder state, and you issue a debug. 
it basically causes the program counter to go into an exception state. Uh, it is not the next value, it is not the branch address. So you have unauthorized alteration, you have unauthorized um, changes, so you have integrity issues, and the processor ends up being in a deadlock, so it is not available for further progress. So that is the reason why these things are highlighted in green. This is a snapshot generated from CBS's website. These things are automatically computed because we have property labels, and when this property fails, our app computes a CVSS score. So <clears throat> in the case of IBEX, this is what we found. Now, if you look at the CVSS score for such kind of failures, it's, it's valued at 8.1, which is pretty serious. So all of these instructions were evaluated, and for PCR, they were all shown to have the problem. For other assets also, we analyzed it. In fact, in IBEX's case, all other assets like register files were also impacted. But as an example, for CV32E40P, zero risky, other processors we looked at from the pulp family, they don't have this issue. So let's look at, a, at an issue that we do have in CV32E40P, which is that if the memory return valid is blocked from going high, then a store instruction can end up blocking the e-break instruction. So e-break is a higher privilege instruction, uh, but it is blocked from getting executed because the store instruction is waiting for a memory return valid to come in, which it doesn't. So you again have a property that fails that is then sent into the app and it comes back with a score of 7.9, pretty serious vulnerability. This is a deadlock. Um, so, you know, we, we can't actually do much here. In terms of zero risky, another interesting thing, this was accidental code left in the design, could have been deliberate, it alters the regular flow of the um, load instruction from memory. So effectively the load from memory then doesn't work like a load from memory, it starts to work as a load from another register, which is not even a risk five instruction. It was a custom um, code, custom instruction, but that has the ability to completely alter the, the fate of zero risky's load instructions and the behavior of the processor affecting confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, all of these. So a simple architectural security check failing highlights this issue in the core. Now somebody could artificially orchestrate and make these changes in the processor, still you will have the same effect, a property will fail. Very high vulnerability score of 10. So this year we have been looking at a number of Warp 5 cores uh, designed by Steve Hoover from Redwood EDA. And we've been finding interesting issues. These cores have been formally verified before using the RISC-5 formal um, test bench. Uh, so WARF-5 are six stage, four stage, and two stage pipeline processors. And here you see the register asset getting compromised because the uh, jump and link instruction actually causes a problem um, and it doesn't actually work as we expect. So line one, three, six, four, is the source of the problem, and that's because the program counter has been instrumented to behave in a quirky way and doesn't actually fit with the definition of uh, the RISC 5 jump instruction. But that's what we're trying to say. So, even though this may have been an accidental bug because the designer um, misunderstood or misinterpreted, this could also be a real issue. So, again, not a very high score, but still an issue that we can quantify. So, here are, here's a, is a quick glimpse of the results. So a number of issues have been found over the years in IBEX, Zero Risky, uh, CV32, 40 p War 5. These are only some of the security bugs that we are highlighting. We found other issues in CV32, 40 p which are also listed on the Git. All of these um, results are, are available on our public Git, and uh, it takes less than a minute to find these issues. So in summary, if you think formal, think of assets and roll out abstractions to obtain proof convergence. That would be a great way of going forward with this approach. So our, our approach is extremely simple, but very productive, effective, and reusable. And it's a comprehensive framework for processor security verification uh, using formal methods. And uh, we can compute vulnerability scores using CVSS scoring system. And our unique abstraction-driven methodology uh, gives 100% proof convergence. We really have no issues with proof convergence, even on six-stage uh, deeply pipeline processors. And our unique scenario coverage solution that we couldn't speak today, but we have uh, information we can give you. We've talked about it uh, in other places. That provides evidences of, of assertion failures and cover failures to give us a view of uh, what was working, what is not. And these coverage properties are reusable in simulation and emulation. Thanks to Shivani Shah, quick shout out to her, Triple IT Bangalore uh, MS student who helped us uh, in working uh, on War 5 processor. And on that note, I would like to stop and take questions.